Making a Stuart model steam plant part 24, a second coat of red paint on the steam chest covers and looking at the kit of parts for the reversing gear. As I mentioned in the previous video, it's quite important not to try and paint these in one coat because the paint will go all crinkly. What you need to do is apply a couple of fairly thick coats which will smooth out the surface of the cast metal. Once again, I'm using Phoenix Precision Paints Buffer Beam Red. Using a very small brush, I've dropped a blob of paint in the centre of the Stuart logo. During this short painting sequence, you will frequently see me withdraw the brush from where the camera's looking. And this is not just to pick up more paint from the tin. More often than not, I'm removing some of the paint from the paintbrush by wiping it on the rim of the can. Yes, I want two fairly thick coats, but once again, it's very tempting just to pour paint into this recess, but if you do that, as I mentioned earlier, as the paint dries, it's very likely to take on a crinkly appearance, and you really don't want that. You can now see quite a big difference between the new coat of paint on the left-hand side, possibly a trifle too thick at the moment, and the first coat of paint on the right-hand side. Another thing that I've noticed when painting models, and I've done quite a lot of that, if you paint too quickly, you can generate air bubbles in the paint. But thankfully, I don't have a problem with that. Here's a gratuitous shot of the paint drying. I will remove any paint that isn't in the recess once it's dried. I'm using some gun wash designed for cleaning spray guns to remove the paint from the brush. In this clip, sat on top of the box of reversing gear parts, are the two pieces of cylinder cladding that I painted a few days ago. This is DMG satin black paint and it's really good stuff. Once it dries it's beautiful. And here I'm putting the parts in a safe place. I've videoed the procedure so I don't forget where the safe place is. Now it's time to turn my attention to the mechanical principles of this engine. There are one or two problems with it. When I tighten the nuts holding the centre bearing in place, the entire engine tightens up. This is no good at all, and I do need to put some very, very fine shims under the centre bearing plate. This is often a problem when you use a steam engine with a built-up crankshaft, errors are introduced, so the two outer bearings are OK, but the centre one causes problems. What I'm doing here is just temporarily fitting two pieces of silicone rubber tubing to stop the steam chest from wandering about. I've put them in each corner, but very soon I will have to move them to accommodate the brackets that hold the reversing shaft. As I now have a good stock of 6BA round head bolts, I've removed the old ones. After I've finished the reversing gear job and one or two other jobs, I'm going to refit the cladding using new bolts. To the right of the engine on the bench is a box of reversing gear parts from Stuart Models. I must tell you that I've never fitted a Stuart Models reversing gear kit. But there's a first time for everything, and there's no time like the present. Everything's very nicely mounted on the vacuum seal cards, and here are the details of where to get your Stuart Models reversing kit from. Manufacturing reversing gear at this size, to me, is a bit like watchmaking. The parts are very, very small. I've made reversing gear for a few locomotives and one or two Stuart No. 5As, but I'm quite pleased that this is a kit ready to fit, or so I thought. Before I start, I need to carefully remove the non-reversing gear from the engine and put the parts in a plastic box that I've been using for other bits and pieces. Watch this action replay for very accurate positioning of a 7BA bolt. I don't think I could have done that a second time. This is another plastic box and this one is full of the new parts for the reversing gear. Some of these parts are very, very small and it's a good idea to put them in a separate container. Here I'm loosening the flywheel to get it out of the way, so I can then remove the valve gear from the other side. This valve gear is now redundant, but it's quite useful to have some Stuart valve gear, particularly if, like me, you work on quite a lot of Stuart engines. In this clip I'm removing the pin that secures the eccentric strap to the valve fork. I mustn't lose this because there aren't enough bolts in the kit, so I need to reuse this link pin. It's not just a bolt. This small bolt has a thread on the end, but most of it is not threaded, it's a plain shaft. Now it's time to remove the first of the eccentric sheaves. I was very surprised to find that it was a tight fit on the shaft, even when I slackened off the grub screw, it took quite a lot of strength to pull it off the shaft. As I removed this original eccentric sheave, 
I didn't appreciate how difficult it was going to be to refit the new eccentric sheaves to operate the reversing mechanism. One thing at a time though, in this episode I'm going to clean up these two mountings. These two castings support the reversing rod and I wanted to clean them up and make them shine a bit so I used my polishing spindle which was really difficult and my fingers are now very dirty as usual because I never wear gloves in the workshop. I don't wear gloves in the workshop because I like to know where my fingers are at all times. It's my own personal interpretation of health and safety. And may I add, it's worked for me for over 50 years. I have at least seven of my fingers completely intact. These parts took an extraordinarily long time to clean up. Even though I used a polishing spindle, I didn't want them to be polished. Here I'm cleaning the burrs from the end of where the holes have been drilled. And here the reason for using an old toothbrush is just to clean away the waxy abrasive residue that I used on the polishing spindle. Now these parts are fairly clean, I think I'm going to put them in my polishing tumbler that I bought. And that should give them a really nice finish, because they're very visible when they're fitted to the engine. This is where the reversing shaft brackets fit, at each end of the steam chests, but don't forget the covers have to go on the steam chests first. And here you can see a problem. The studs are not long enough, but thankfully in the kit are some longer studs. They're not here, these are some other studs for other jobs. The special long studs were in the box of bolts, which came with the kit. In this clip I'm removing the old studs that I no longer require, just by fitting a couple of lock nuts and then undoing them like this. Using a pair of lock nuts is a standard way to fit and remove studs on model steam engines and probably a lot of other things. This is the first of the longer studs fitted and you can see how it's going to work. When I assemble everything, there's just enough thread protruding to allow the fitting of a nut to hold everything tight. There are four of these extended studs to fit, and after testing the length of the first one, it was fine, so I fitted the other three. With these studs though, I didn't need to use lock nuts, I just nipped them up with a pair of pliers. Bad practice perhaps, but there's no thread where I used the pliers. The stud wasn't marked in any way, and it's much quicker than doing it with the lock nut method. Even though these brackets are not in the right position, owing to the steam chest covers not being fitted, I thought I would fit the reversing bar to see what it looked like. There's quite a long way to go yet to fit this reversing gear. It is not as easy as you think, as you will find out in the next episode. That's all for now. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main steam models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.